In the beginning, it was only about survival, and meat was the perfect choice. Three million years ago, our ancestors started to enrich their food with animal proteins, which eventually led to them becoming humans, because the valuable meat proteins stimulated the brain development. And so we have become what we are. For centuries, there hasn't been meat in such an abundance. It was rather rare and expensive. Today, it is a cheap mass product with serious consequences for the environment, animals and people. An alternative could come from the laboratory, cultured mead. Grown in incubators, without environmental destruction, without diseases, without animal suffering. We make meat without killing a cow. A revolutionary promise, or only wishful thinking. Hi, I am Mark Post. I am a professor of physiology at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. My major research interest is tissue engineering, and I applied that to making meat for consumption. Um, in fact, in 2013, we presented the world's first hamburger made out of stem cells from a cow. Of course, we also find such icons of modern carnal desire at Mark's Barbecue with friends and colleagues. But they're still conventional, made of meat grown in cattle and not bred in a laboratory. <laughs> as much as scientist Mark Post knows how problematic the topic meat is these days, as much does he love to eat meat, even if he sometimes has a bad conscience because of it. I guess the most illustrative thing is that I've tried to become vegetarian a couple of times, but I just failed pathetically. So for some reason, this is part of my life, part of my food, part of who I am, I guess. Just under 25 square meters, rather plain and sober. Not at all like a witch's kitchen. But this is where historical events took place, and Mark was in charge. For in his laboratory, most of the approximately 10,000 pieces of muscle fiber were produced about five years ago, virtually handmade. The basis for the world's first hamburger made of cultured mead, with a technique that certainly isn't magic. So I have a, a sample of muscle tissue here from a cow. I'm cutting it in very, very small pieces so that eventually the stem cells in that muscle can grow out, so that I can culture. But the cells need something to eat for that, a nutrient medium that supports the growth and division of cells. Calf flax blood serum is perfectly suited for this purpose. But for cultured mead on a large scale, it is hardly acceptable, much too expensive, and besides, animals have to die for it. That's why they're working on so-called animal-free alternatives in Mark's laboratory. Plant-based growth media that provide the cells with everything they need to become meat. Meat from the incubator. So now we are putting the cells in this incubator, which is basically a human body, same temperature, same moisture and this is what's needed for the cells to grow. And they grow fast, one division every 24 hours. It's called exponential growth. Theoretically, 1,000 trillion cells in 50 days. That's 10,000 kilograms of meat, if everything works, and not only on a small scale. So this is why we are all doing this. This is a small hamburger, very small, made out of cultured meat fibers through the process that we showed here. 
um, and you could cook it and eat it. Real meat, grown in the laboratory. In an impressively simple manner, as Mark's animation once again shows. It all starts with the harmless collection of a tissue sample from a cow. This sample also contains muscle tissue, which is broken down into tiny parts to eventually separate cells. These cells are then activated to divide. Millions of more cells can be produced from one muscle cell. Many cells together form muscle tissue in a natural way. And that's meat after all, for a hamburger for example. And that's how it was presented. Summer 2013, world premiere, Media Hype, a famous London music studio, and probably the most expensive piece of meat of all times. It cost $331,400 to produce it. Paid by Google co-founder Sergey Brin for 140 grams of cultured meat. In the studio, two utterly fearless people tasting. Clear judgment, the mouthfeel is meat. But somehow dry, it lacks the typical juicy taste. What's lacking is fat. I'm trying to get fat, basically. So, you know, we started... And that's not so easy. Meanwhile, Gunther Prohaska knows that too. He's a member of a small student research group around Mark Post, who are trying to make cultured meat suitable for mass production. You can't do without fat. After all, the meat from the incubator has to taste good. But fat cells are far more difficult to gain than muscle cells, because certain cell functions must be chemically controlled from the outside with substances that are not suitable for consumption. One idea could be to work with fatty acids like omega-9 or 6. Scientist Post knows only too well that his hamburger a few years ago was basically just a feasibility study. To get cultured meat really ready for the market means to go a long way and to solve many problems and not just for academic glory. The real reason why I'm doing this is um, food security and um, environmental protection. So we need to feed 9 billion people in 2050. Um, we need to have enough resources to do that. Um, and we need to do that in a way that doesn't harm the environment unnecessarily. Um, Livestock meat production is a big burden on environment and on resources. So that's the first thing we need to tackle. About 60 years ago, the global meat requirement was only 71 million tons per year. Since then, it has risen enormously, approximately 322 million tons last year. These figures show how much this hunger for meat burdens the environment. Approximately 70% of the world's agricultural area is used for livestock farming. Up to 50% of the world's grain production is turned into cattle feed. Meat production requires a lot of water. One kilogram of pork, about 10,000 liters. One kilogram of beef, even 15,000 liters. And a good 20% of global greenhouse gases are caused by livestock farming worldwide. It's never really winter here. And even just before Christmas, the beach of Tel Aviv still gives many a real sea holiday feeling. Anything goes, somehow, here on Israel's Riviera. Despite everyday inconsistencies. In a society that tries to stay in balance. Israel is a paradise for meat despisers, really. Proportionally, most of the world's vegans and vegetarians live here. Sweet sugar pop, sugar pop, rocks pop, you don't 
Nevertheless, or maybe because of that, there are particularly many scientists in Little Israel who work with cultured meat. I'm Professor Yaakov Nachmias. I am the director of the Alexander Grass Center for Bioengineering at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I'm a chemical engineer by training, and I've spent over the last 15 years of my life working on tissue engineering. More specifically, for years, Yaakov has been an expert on everything that has to do with liver or liver cells. He has only been working with cultured meat for three years. The scientist is concerned about poultry, the most consumed meat in Israel. Muscle meat and fat, that's the challenge here too. But Yaakov thinks he has solved this problem by simply reprogramming chicken's connective tissue cells. The fibroblasts are the connective tissue that will uh, fix our skin uh, every time we get cut. They grow much faster than, than muscle and we can grow them with an, without using animal serum and animal components in my lab. Um, the really innovative part is the fact that those chicken cells that we have ob obtained can uh, make both fat and muscle. And here you can see some of the work that we've been working on for the last several months, taking those chicken cells and transforming them very, very fast to fat cells. What Yaakov calls innovative, however, is not entirely undisputed because the technique of reprogramming cells can also cause their genetic material to be altered. New methods should prevent this. We're doing it with a method that is very, very important for us. We're doing it without genetic modification. That means we are creating a product that is going to be uh, non-GMO. Uh, it's going to be the normal chicken fat, a chicken muscle that we eat every day without any genetic modifications. Fat is not a problem and animal serum not necessary. And the cells grow particularly fast. For Yaakov, these are very important partial successes on the way to implement his idea of how cultured meat could be made marketable. We're trying to bring down the cost of cell production, mass production, meat production, down dramatically. The first cultured burger cost about $3 million per kilogram. Uh, Memphis Meats is now being able to produce the, cell, the same cell mass for about $30,000 per kilogram. What we believe is that we can bring down the cost to around $5 per kilogram. That's the engineering challenge. And if we solve that, we'll be able to get into the market very, very fast. And this here is an essential part of the technical challenge, the model of a bioreactor, a kind of incubator actually, that can be controlled and supplied externally. If it were up to Yaakov Namias, cultured meat should grow in such devices, but not in an expensive 25,000 liter unit, but in inexpensive small five liter containers. Israel is a startup nation, a population of 8.5 million inhabitants and around 7,000 founding companies. That's a world record. In Israel, people are used to risks. Measured by its population, there is no other country in the world where so much venture capital is invested. And he's the head of such a young venture company. Ohad Kanyeli Biotech, cell therapy, planning of laboratory equipment. They are specialized in individual developments for unusual applications. Simply different than the usual. When you use it in the biotech industry, you can use stainless steel or glass, wash it, clean it, sterilize it with your equipment and go again. But there's a long cycle time around it. With this case, you just open the bag, you have a single-use element, you install it, and you're ready to use. You finish, you throw this out. Much simpler, and it could be much cheaper. Disposable reactors, for domestic use, so to speak, and they're supposed to produce only small amounts of cultured meat. 
So one of the ideas that we're thinking what to do with Yaakov or Kobe is basically uh, having a single-use element, very cheap, very cost-effective, like a bag. You can have a bag, inside you can have your, your cultured meat, and basically open it into such a device where it's heated and warmed, the media is replaced, and basically you can culture it. Once you're finished, you open, take it out, and it's ready. A simple method, a simple technique. But the challenges will probably be in the details here too. Ohant knows that and is therefore rather cautious when it comes to forecasting. So I personally think this will become really uh, an industry, but it will take time. So it will be two steps. The first step would be cells in some kind of food and just to give the nutrition of it. And then the next stage, 10, 15 years down the road, you will see a real steak cultured in a facility but that's the long-term vision of it. A vision that could make a career in Israel. The country lives a remarkable paradox. On the one hand, there are many vegans and vegetarians. On the other hand, especially many who eat meat. Judging by the number of inhabitants, Israel is the fourth largest meat consumer in the world, referring to poultry even the largest. But beef has also become increasingly popular for years, even though hardly any cattle are kept in the country itself, a reason for the price being so high. Israeli steaks from the incubator could become a real alternative, and that's exactly what they're working on here in Haifa. I'm Professor Shulamit Levenberg. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering at the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. Currently, I lead the research on uh, cultured meat, and our goal is to create pieces of, uh, uh, of meat in the lab that can be used as food product. A real piece of meat, not finely minced like originally in Maastricht. That's a particular technological challenge. The meat cells must grow in three dimensions. We try to get a piece of the muscle, so you can say like a steak. So of course we will need the muscle cells because this is a muscle tissue, so the muscle cells that can form the fibers. But we also want the other uh, part of the tissue. We want the blood vessels, the tubes that are going through the tissue. We want some fat tissue, we want the, exocel the right exocellular matrix that the, the, the support cells can secrete. So we would like to, to mimic the whole environment, the whole cellular environment that's come together with the muscle cells. A suitable scaffold. For Shulamit Levenberg, it's the key to finally produce proper meat cuts. So here you see one of the scaffolds that uh, we make here in the lab, the sponges on which the cells will be grown. So the pores of the scaffold, this is where the cells will sit and start to proliferate and secrete matrix and will start to form the tissue. The sponge scaffold, but also these artificial blood vessels, consist of substances that occur in the body. So they can be eaten without hesitation. Almost all employees in the Levenberg laboratory work on the steak challenge. And most of them think they will master it, not without reason. Scientifically, Shulamit has already performed some groundbreaking work. For example, she was the first to cultivate human heart tissue, which was able to form blood vessels on its own. And that's why almost everyone here believes that it will take less than 10 to 15 years until a steak can be produced in the incubator. And there are two important reasons to believe that such steaks will first be offered in Israel. I think there is a potential for Israel to be one of the first places to have this type of product. Israel people are very open and have a lot of courage and they like to try new things. And actually, as a, in Judaism, your, your task is to improve the world, is actually to, to make the world a better place. This is one of the things you have to do as a, as a person living. Uh, so. I think this is one of the important things, and what we try to do is really to improve the world, either, either for medicine or, or improving now when creating new food products. 
About 4,000 kilometers further north, people also try to improve the world. And here too, many things seem to be open, transparent, open-minded, or make you curious. Nathalie Roland and Freya Meta from the research group of Mark Post. It's about hamburgers, cultured meat, and the question of acceptance. Randomly selected students or employees of Maastricht University will each taste a conventional and a cultured meat patty. Will the test subjects eat the cultured meat burger at all? And how does it taste in comparison to the conventional? I think it tasted exactly like a normal hamburger. I couldn't have told a difference. I found the consistency, I don't want to say Dutch, but it was a bit like Dutch meat, so very small chopped. I thought that was the artificial hamburger. I thought that's how I'd recognize that it is artificial, but the normal hamburger was the same. To find a difference in taste wouldn't have been easy. The test subjects only received conventional hamburgers. Cultured meat would have been far too expensive. The goal of the representative test was to find out whether previously queried critical attitudes towards medical cell research affected the taste perception. In other words, to find out whether there are prejudices against cultured meat. My impression is just that it's very positive because we can uh, think that it will be very difficult just uh, for the people to eat the meat because of the fact that it's grown in a lab. But uh, apparently, it's not the case. Consumers are, are ready for this meat because they, they know that uh, it will be better for the environment, uh, for the animal welfare, it should be uh, more healthy and uh, with a better control of the production. So, yes, I think they are, really, they are uh, waiting uh, for the culture meat uh, just to, to come to the market. Overall, the test subjects were right with their assessment, which is shown by a scientific paper that compares the ecological burden of traditional beef production and cultured meat. According to it, greenhouse gas emissions from cultured meat are 95% lower than beef from live cattle. Cultured meat requires 93% less land than normal cattle breeding. The water consumption of cultured meat is 45% lower than with conventional beef. In terms of energy consumption, however, cultured meat, due to the bioreactors, is more or less identical with normal beef. It's usually best at lunchtime an executive meeting at the Mosa Meat Company. Mark Post and Peter Verstraete. Mosa Meat is a startup company that was founded about 20 months ago. By these two and Maastricht University. With the goal to turn laboratory successes into genuine products for the food market. A task on an industrial scale, hardly suitable for universities. First um, production of cells. That's going to happen in big bioreactors, think 25,000 liters, uh, that have to be filled, that have to be maintained. There are technicians doing that type of work. Then the second step is to make tissues out of those uh, large amounts of cells. That requires automation, so basically development and design and building of machinery that automates that part. Then there is a regulatory approval. And finally, there's going to be marketing and packaging and distribution. And, and all these things are really company activities and, and not university activities. After all, it's also about money. More than that, it's about backers. Um, to find them is one of the most important tasks of a startup. Peter Festrate is mainly responsible for the financial part of the project of Mosa Meat, to make sure there's money for market maturity development. So we need about three years to do that. For that we need about five to ten million euros. Um, that's quite a range. If we have more we can do it a little bit faster, if we have less we will take a little bit longer, but that's about it, what we need for that. Once we get to that point and we start actually building in a factory, uh, that's going to take tens of millions of euros. Uh, you've got to think in amounts of like 50 to 100 to, to maybe even more. So 
then the big money comes in. Meat is a, is a one trillion plus dollar uh, consumer market. It's huge. So if you have a valid alternative for, for traditional meat, uh, you, you have something. Approaching London City Airport, the Docklands. Almost half of the year he's on the road in the matter of cultured meat. As a scientist, at congresses and lectures, but also to meet investors, personal contact is important. After all, it's about private money and a product that doesn't even yet exist. Sarah Lucas is the head of a self-founded Australian animal welfare organization, one of the ethical investors, but they're in the minority at Mosamit. The motivation for us is animal welfare and factory farming is perhaps the practice which causes the most suffering for animals. And what's so exciting and promising about this technology is that it has the amazing potential to um, virtually overnight eliminate the need for factory farming for the benefit of you know, over 50 billion animals every year. Whom are you directing this to? And Mosa Meat gets a total of 150,000 euros from Sarah for this. She considers the risk to be manageable. Sarah had previously obtained comprehensive information, also about the other eight startups that work worldwide on the development of cultured meat. Mark's work has convinced her, and she personally hopes for quick success. Absolutely. Um, the only reason that I don't eat meat is because I, I don't like the way that it's produced and I don't want to be part of, um, you know, a practice which is, causes really horrific suffering for animals and clean meat involves no suffering for animals and um, I love the taste of meat so if um, and meat was on the market that didn't have any um, disadvantages for animals I would definitely eat it. The taste of meat, certainly not insignificantly responsible for expressions like, I could eat a horse. Worldwide, the booming economies of former emerging countries show the biggest rates of growth concerning the greed for animals. No good news for nature, animals and humans, because the chic vegetarian or vegan trend in many industrialized countries will hardly be able to absorb the world's gigantic lust for meat. Cultured meat could be the alternative, but it has to taste just as nice.